and it does take place in the year 1891. Though a lot of this could still be used to talk about being a renter in New Orleans today, which is why well, <laughs> I found that out. Here. Gregory found the railway man a good, solid type, and wishing to avoid any further contretemps, sought the official's advice for lodgings, and so he found himself directed to this place. Sit, oh, one other caveat. Please forgive my fake southern accent. That's <laughs> <laughs> a real thing. I was thinking of mine on the board aside, but all the belt, just as the train worker described. Of the esteemed lady of the house, the worker had said, one Miss Ida Fisher. Folks want to call her the widow. We never met a woman more fond of coin, could depress even the devil himself, but the spot's not so bad with bed lice. That ringing endorsement went through Gregor's head, and with the greater understanding that life forms a series of events on the actions of the individual, almost like experiments, that once set into motion cannot be undone, the young man heaved the trunk of the last of the porch steps with one final shove, where it landed on what appeared to be a pile of rags and dirty knickers, and pounded on the side door with a knocker, which promptly came off in his hand. You're in luck, Mr. Stresenberg, the widow said, standing at the top of the third flight of stairs and throwing her full weight against the door jam before it opened into a weather-beaten garret. This is the best single in the house and only recently vacated. A wet light towel hung on the nail by the wash basin, and a narrow, unmade cot leaned up against the dormer window, draped with a faded quilt and little curtains. A chip mirror and escritoire with missing handles, its drawers left half open, all contributing to the general impression of a previous tenant who had left under duress. Six dollars a week, meals included. Besides, what should be owing me to fix that door knob when you went broke like a fool. Mind you, I rent to some folk. I make no bones as long as you follow house laws. She laughed, exposing a mouth with a few teeth. The law of the house, you're out of coin, you're out of days. Gregor nodded. I always say, she continued, in a smoothing her apron, I'm nothing if not a reasonable woman, Mr. Stusenberg. Gregor assessed the space. His only ambition was to further the scientific inquiry of his last mentor of his late mentor, and he desperately needed the adequate living quarters to do so. This private room on the top floor of an anonymous bunkhouse could meet all of his home wants, though he balked at the price and the reek of whiskey and onions. A healthy, large rat crawled out from under the basin, sniffed the air, and ambled along the floorboards into the corridor. Hmm. One rat in such robust form usually meant many rats, and many rats meant an ample supply of free test subjects which Gregor would only incur the small cost of scraps of cheese. In order to continue the doctor's legacy, he still had much to learn and felt determined not to harm any more people in the process. <coughs> Making a quick calculation of his head, he felt the expense would be worth it. The doctor had been an advocate of shocks applied across meridians of the face and chest. He believed the secret to eternal youth could be found in the life-giving forces of electricity in careful combination with induced magnetism. The first awareness of flaws in the doctor's methodology should have occurred to Gregor with the doctor's own untimely passing. <laughs> Yet Gregor blindly continued on conducting his mentor's work when recently one Miss Elizabeth Butler from Black Hills County lost the abilities of speech after a particularly invasive session. Not the first time such a side effect had been known to occur, but given the rancor of being just run out of the last town, Gregor had concluded upon arriving here at his next court call, he would refrain from assisting human patients and instead return to the doctor's papers till he could pinpoint the deficiency in the theory. I'll need to make some alterations to the place, Gregor said, walking the perimeter of the small alcove, tracing his finger around the wall looking for gapes in the plaster to where the light could leak in. What sort of alterings do you plan on? A darker paper and proper curtain, he answered. I need only artificial light sources for my work. The first chapter of the doctor's unpublished thesis clearly stated that electromagnetic rays could not penetrate the outer epidermis exposed to the sun. The widow smoothed her apron and again grumped, smiling her already rather narrow eyes. I'm a reasonable woman, Mr. Strusenberg, she said. I do my best with all my cooking and scrubbing. I ask a pittance, and I can't see much as any of the fancy decorating and artificialized nonsense to boot. But madam, Gregor stopped examining the walls, removed his hat, turning to face the widow and Ernest. My enterprise would be of no extraneous expense to you. I'm working on a theory for the Journal of New and Virgin Sciences in America, and I need the darker paper to ensure continuity of my experiments. Experiments, I might add, that in time can lead to a lucrative discovery. She wiped her hands on the apron and did her own calculations. Well, most people tell me, Mrs. Fisher, they say, you are nothing if not a reasonable woman. I wouldn't want to get in the way of your experiments, no, sir. 
Madam, I will select a burgundy velvet of the highest quality, Gregory Scherger. She gave a final hurrah, muttered something about being reasonable and more to herself than him, and left to prepare the evening meal, slamming the door several times behind her before it shut. Gregor, as a man of science, thought the very need to point out one's reasonability in and of itself constituted an assuredly unreasonable quality to one's own nature. <laughs>